So now um, I would uh, I will talk for maybe 15, 20 minutes about uh, critical thinking. Uh, then we do the um, and then we do the uh, practical exercise. But uh, one of the messages which I'm trying to um, um, get across is um, um, critical thinking, in my opinion, is not important, not just for researchers, but also for clinicians. And this is, uh, I think, what we've seen over the last few days is often uh, a discussion where, I think rightly so, uh, clinicians feel that what these researchers are doing there is all very fancy and very bright, very intelligent, very smart, uh, but they feel it's not necessarily relevant um, for their clinical practice. Um, and one of the things which I'm trying to communicate is that critical thinking is important for clinical practice, equally important for clinical practice as it is in science. And um, so we're just going to do a few exercises and a few um, uh, uh, short um, sessions on uh, uh, in which I will talk a little bit about critical thinking, decision processes, uh, and a bit how our brain works uh, and how our brain can affect our decisions. Um, so I'm going to show you a slide with two lines. And uh, I just want you to... <coughs> answer immediately the question which line do you think is longer so just look at it and say well gut feeling which line is longer uh, can I have um, votes please uh, uh, who who think that this line is longer the one at the top uh, who thinks the one at the bottom is longer okay. well in actual fact the lines are equally long um, uh, you look strictly at these two lines, the lines are equally long. Now, let's do another one. Uh, how tall are the soldiers? Just gut feeling. Your, what is your immediate initial reaction? Yeah. The one on the right is longer, isn't it? Or not? Or what do people think? How tall are the soldiers? Uh, which tall uh, is this so, uh, soldier the tallest or not? Who thinks it's the tallest? All right. Yeah. Now, in actual fact, um, both lines are equally long, uh, and all soldiers are equally tall. Um, now, something is happening because I think what most of you realize is that it's kind of hard. Uh, not to think that the soldier on the right is tallest. Your, your gut reaction, if you, it's, it seems very obvious. And this is actually uh, related to the way our human brain functions because we, our brain tends to think, look at things not in isolation, but we tend to look at the context around it. Um, and so we're using the information, the kind of perspective which is generated by the line the lines w are, are, in this case, uh, trying to suggest a third dimension to you. And our brains simply use that information. So basically, we are trying to think as if this is in perspective. And because we apply the model that there is a third dimension to these figures, it seems longer. But if you so sort of completely ignore it, if you would strip this part of the graph, you just look at the figures, you would notice that there are, or you put the ruler on them, when you only look at two dimensions, they are all equally long. And it's the same with these two lines. And <coughs> Now, the key message here is that I'm, I've asked you the question, how tall are the soldiers and how long is the line? That was the question I asked you. But you used all the information that was available. Uh, so if you would have just focused on two dimensions, you would have answered the question correctly. But your immediate reaction was I gave you information and you used this information. The human brain works like that because we're used to looking at patterns. We're used to looking at the total uh, information and it's very hard to ignore information even though this information, the perspective in this case, makes us give us the wrong answer. It's very hard to ignore. Now, um, 
psychologists uh, have this have described this as our brain being guided by two systems and there's one uh, system is fast the other one is slow and uh, the main characteristics of this fast thinking system is that it creates a coherent pattern of activated ideas and associated memory now that sounds very complicated but basically in the previous exercise our fast thinking systems immediately saw these three soldiers but it saw the perspective as well it tried to look at these soldiers actually in their in their in the context there um, now it links a sense of cognitive e ease to illusions of truth uh, and pleasant feelings and reduced vigilance in other words if if we wouldn't have spoken longer about this if you wouldn't have gotten the ruler and just simply measured up these two lines and realized they are equally long we you would have said okay fine that one is longer it's not no big deal so the fast system thinking uh, the, the the fast system can also be dangerous because it can lead to bias it can lead to um, now it gets worse in a way because the fast system actually infers and invents causes and intentions in other words again to come back to the very simple graph your fast systems used this information which was irrelevant for the question uh, and it invented uh, an illusion our brain invented an illusion that this one is longer so it's a tricky one because our brain is playing tricks with us and our brain is using inventing in this case that this figure is longer um, now another thing is that uh, the fast system neglects ambiguity and suppresses doubt. <coughs> so in other words, a, f a fast system, doubt doesn't really exist. A fast system just processes the world we are in and tries to come up with a very snap decision. Now, in evolution, there's a lot of function of that. Our brains have been evolutionally hardwired to function like this because there were distinct advantages uh, to it uh, survival advantages to having a very fast processing system and even if this system is wrong uh, uh, that wasn't necessarily a bad thing if for instance if you were uh, walking on the uh, uh, on the savannah and there was a lion or you know your fast system uh, thinking system senses, senses danger uh, and okay if there's no danger you're still alive but if there's danger and you're wrong, you're dead. So some of these mechanisms are, are geared towards believing and conforming. Uh, and it focuses on the existing evidence and, and ignores absent evidence. Now that's a very interesting one as well. And so because just in this example again, you're presented with the evidence. The evidence was a perspective and three soldiers. Um, so you focus on what you can see, and what you can't see, you, you would ignore. And worryingly, it cannot be switched off, uh, and it often occurs even without us noticing it. So that's a tricky one, because in science you always want to know, okay, you want to be rational, you want to say, okay, uh, uh, but this occurs without your volunteered control. So you cannot just say, Okay, I'm now going to ma make my fast thinking uh, unbiased. Because you, you cannot prevent yourself from doing it, because it's the, our brains are hard, we're hardwired to do it. Um, now, there uh, is a slow thinki uh, uh, thinking system, and it allocates attention to the effortful mental, uh, mental activities that demand it. They're associated with subjective experience of choice and concentration. In other words, you really uh, focus. So now when you're, you, when you're saying, when I'm saying, now look again at this picture and try to ignore this. You really have to make an effort. And I see the lady here, she's really, so you can really see her concentrating on the picture. And that's, that's a slow thinking system. You're trying to uh, say, well, 
let's look at these toads and ignore this information. Or let's look at the lines and forget about these things. Just look, focus on this. Now, then you think, oh, yeah, the lines are equally wrong. So, but it takes concentration. It takes effort. That is the um, uh, characteristics here. Um, and you can, uh, it o operates under your voluntary control. And there you can say, oh, wait a second, hold on now. Wait a second. Now I'm going to concentrate. I'm going to ignore some other bits. I'm going to really concentrate on this. That you can control. And it has been uh, mentioned the lazy controller of the fast thinking system. So you can uh, exert some control. Uh, but what psychologists have found is that it's quite lazy. And when we get stressed, or when we get on the strain, or when we're distracted by other things, these control system mechanisms are, are failing. Um, and its function is disrupted when attention is drawn away, or when we're tired, when we're, uh, all kinds of mechanisms can um, create confusion there. Um, now, why uh, do we have two uh, systems of thinking? Uh, and the reason is again uh, relating to evolution. Uh, a fast thinking system is generally very good at dealing with familiar s uh, uh, situations. So a clinician who has seen a lot of patients uh, with a particular condition, uh, maybe with an appendicitis or with a, with a, with a clinician will immediately <coughs> say, oh, this is a dangerous patient, send him to the hospital. So it's a very useful si situation when there's familiar situation which you have been confronted with before. Now, the slow system uh, thinking system is activated when an event is detected that violates the model of the world that is maintained by the fast thinking system. So again, to come back to this very simple exercise, when, when I said, no, uh, the lines are equally long, then your slow s thinking system kicked in and said, is that really true? And everybody started, uh, start looking and you look again and you have to focus your attention um, now the fact so the evolution has equipped that with both uh, with both systems and the division of labor actually minimizes effort and optimizes performance so there is a, a very strong reason why we have both systems now in the in the in the English language we use the word paying attention and you say pay attention um, so this that's what the slow system would does but uh, it's 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 interesting when you say paying attention in other words when you need to pay something you need a budget when uh, the organizers of this conference uh, need to pay the hotel uh, for this room you need money to pay uh, for the room now our mind works the same way the slow system system we need to pay for it and so and our ability to concentrate, our ability to pay attention is limited. So our budget is not that we can, it's not limitless. Um, and uh, we'll see that it can have uh, a consequence. So now we're going to uh, do a small uh, uh, experiment. I'm going to show you a, a short video clip. Uh, uh, and basically, um, uh, it's self-explanatory, but basically, uh, the question asked is people are going to pass a ball there's two teams they're going to pass a ball and, and the question is uh, how many times uh, is the white ball uh, being passed uh, the, the team passed in the, white, in the white team now this will be explained again so all you have to do is uh, focus on uh, how many times the ball was passed by the white team to count that I hope the technology is going to work. Um, and I hope the sound is going to work. So let's see how this uh, goes. Players wearing white pass the ball. Sorry, I'll make it big.
The correct answer is 16 passes. Did you spot the gorilla? For people who haven't seen or heard of Who spotted the gorilla? Who did not spot the gorilla? Be honest, I didn't spot it. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, so, quite a few of you didn't spot the gorilla, did you? I see some baffled faces. People just, you know, there was no gorilla. Uh, okay, so right. So the question is, uh, it's about half of the people who see this video, they miss the gorilla. Uh, now, let's spin it back. The monkey business illusion. Count how many times... Oh, sorry. Sorry. The monkey business illusion. Count how many times the players wearing white pass the ball. So actually, the monkey, <laughs> the monkey comes up on stage. He beats his chest. <laughs> and he, keep, he keeps walking. Now, uh, um, so if you would have said this beforehand to people, what's the likelihood that you're going to miss that? Uh, and 50% of people uh, uh, will miss it. Um, Answer is 16 passes. Did you spot the gorilla? For people who haven't seen or heard about a video like this before, about half missed the gorilla. If you knew about the gorilla, you probably saw it. But did you notice the curtain changing color or the player on the black team leading the game? Let's rewind and watch it again. <laughs> Here comes the gorilla, and there goes a player, and the curtain is changing from red to gold. When you're looking for a gorilla, you often miss other unexpected events. And that's the monkey business illusion. Learn more about this illusion and the original gorilla experiment at theinvisiblegorilla.com. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's, no, let's go back into full view. So what's the lesson? Well, one of the lessons is that we can be blind to the obvious, um, but it's, it's even worse. We can be blind to our own blindness. Um, but the lesson is also when we focus with our slow thinking processes on one task, uh, we miss other things because we only have a limited budget of attention. Uh, and if we focus to all our budget on making the passes, our brain simply doesn't have a uh, sufficient budget available uh, to focus on the other things. Now, the more tired you are, the less sleep you would have had, the more distracted you would have been for other reasons, um, yeah, would affect that. So bias, now you're familiar with this word bias, you're all studying science one way or another. Bias is any kind of distortion of reality brought by the design, selection, observation, classification, analysis, or interpretation of result. So this is the very common definition of bias you were used to as in epidemiology. And actually bias is not equal to error. Because error is non-systematic, uh, so you can 
if you have a measurement error, if you have a blood pressure and you measure the blood pressure, the more if you measure it 20 times on average, you'll get the right measurement. Bias means that 20 times you repeat it 20 times, but you 20 times you're systematically too high or systematically too low. Um, now, what we are beginning to touch upon is that that there are not just uh, only epidemiological biases, and these are the biases, of course, we're all familiar with. These are the biases we're being taught at university. Um, uh, there are so-called cognitive uh, illusions and biases. Now, you may wonder why am I speaking about this now? Well, it's because any process where human beings are confronted with facts, where they have to make decisions, cognitive biases are important. Uh, a lot of this uh, speech is uh, inspired by um, what's what called behavioral economics. They, have, they are e economics and uh, eco economists and, are, and psychologists who, who, who study the behavior of people when they buy things or when they don't buy things. Um, and so this is very similar to behavior of a doctor who has to make decisions under uncertain circumstances, what is the best treatment uh, for this particular patient. So uh, obviously the, the classical epidemiological biases uh, are w very well known. Uh, there are more storks in rural areas compared to urban areas. That's the classical families in rural areas are on average larger. So <coughs> therefore the babies are, um, are delivered by the storks. No, or maybe that's not the correct answer. So this is the classical uh, epidemiological uh, example where there can be a, a wrong, where you can draw a wrong conclusion. Uh, so we're familiar with this. Uh, now we all also probably know about the physician's best friend uh, and it's called regression to the mean. Uh, again, I'm not going to go too deep into it now, I'm just touching on it, uh, but it's an, a general phenomenon that will inevitably occur when correlations between the two measures are less than perfect. Now, any medicine given by a, um, a doctor to a patient is a less than perfect correlation. Um, and so regression to the mean will occur in, in every single therapeutic encounter. But it's a statistical phenomenon. And the worst thing is not even the placebo effect. Uh, so it's not, a, it's, it's not an effect. It's not even a cause but it does contribute to the placebo response because ultimately the placebo response will con constitute of the placebo effect plus regression to the mean. Now, um, uh, without going into the detail, there's a little diagram here. This is, for instance, your uh, HDL co cholesterol and you make a baseline observation. Uh, then simply by regression to the mean, even if you do nothing, if you would do Simply an experiment where someone would, would do, walk into oh sorry I'm moving the microphone here someone would walk into a doctor's clinic the doctor wouldn't say anything they just take a bl the blood sample would be taken uh, at baseline and after a month the, uh, the the subject would walk in back into the clinic the doctor doesn't say anything doesn't do anything doesn't pr apply any therapy simply due to regression to the mean uh, on average. Uh, uh, for those who were at the, at the extreme of the distribution, they will have regressed uh, simply for statistical reasons because natural phenomena are fluctuating. And so if you happen to be there at baseline, you're more likely to be there at follow-up. Um, so one of some of the take-home messages is obviously not all changes you observe have a specific cause. So if in clinical case-based report, not every change you observe in the case will have a specific cause. Um, it's very counterintuitive. It took mathematicians more than 100 years to understand this phenomenon. Uh, uh, it's, again, you need to do slow thinking to understand that it's not everything, not every change you observe in reality and in nature has a cause. <laughs> can be just statistics. Now, so our fast thinking mind is strongly biased towards causal explanations. 
and doesn't deal well with mere statistics. So this has been also found by these behavioral economists who look at people and um, have observed people and consistently um, we, we, we our fast thinking process wants to find the cause even if there is none. That's, that's a very important message. And it favors certainty over doubt. Uh, and there will be an overwhelming tendency to see create a, a pattern in randomness. Uh, in other words, our mind, our fast thinking mind is geared towards creating a rich image based on the available bits of data. Uh, and there was a reason for this again, to come back to the evolutionary mechanism, is that if when we were in a situation where there were wild animals around, if there was any change in our environment, uh, we were on the lookout for that, for possible causes for changes in our environment. And so now we transplant ourselves to the medical encounter, a change occurs in a medical encounter, and our brains are geared to thinking, oh, there must be a cause of that. And as some of the changes observed, they don't even have a cause. Then there's confirmation bias. It was already briefly uh, uh, raised. And one of, one of them is called the halo effect. And I'll just do a very short experiment. Who do you like more? We're describing Alan here. I think you have it in your... Um, so Alan is intelligent, industrious, impulsive, critical, stubborn, envious. And Ben is envious, stubborn, critical, impulsive, industrious, and intelligent. Now, who do you like more? Alan. Hmm? Now, what does our brain do? The, the, the quality stubborn is actually interpreted in context. It's an ambiguous term. It can sometimes, when someone is stubborn, it's considered a positive quality. Because innovators, uh, like innovators in traditional Korean medicine, I'm sure a number of them are stubborn people. Because the, all the Western medicine uh, people say, no, what you're doing is, uh, uh, it's, it's, so innovators have a certain stubbornness, and this stubbornness can be a good quality for them to persevere, even though people around them say, no, 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 what you're doing is rubbish, it has no scientific basis. Hahnemann, the founder of homeopathy, fits perfectly with this. He's an extremely stubborn man, but he founded a whole therapeutic system. Uh, <laughs> um, so, but stubbornness is an ambiguous term, and it will therefore be interpreted to make it coherent with the context. And the context here is that the first th bit, the first th thing you saw is that he was intelligent. And so you interpreted stubbornness in the context of intelligence, where here, first, the first thing you saw is an envious person. Now, uh, the, the saying is always, you never get a second chance to make a first impression. Um, the first impression that you will have, even of a person, uh, will, will guide some of the things. So maybe the fact that I have a very nice tie and a very nice suit, makes a difference. It's biased because let's say I have a very nice tie and a very nice suit and I say nonsense, you will still be a bit more likely to believe me uh, than if I wouldn't have a very nice tie and a very nice suit. And, and there is hundreds and thousands of ther experiments done in psychology who confirm this. This is a very, very solid uh, thing. And it's called the halo effect. Uh, because the first impression will color uh, uh, your observation. And then uh, there's this other nasty thing, and it's called what you, what you see is all there is. <coughs> and it, it means that it's a bit like a, a confirmation bias, uh, because our fast thinking will just simply use the available uh, information. In other words, our fast thinking simply says, what do I have, what do I see? And it will use everything it can see, but it will not think about, okay, what's the quality of what I see? And maybe what you see is not complete, maybe there's bits missing in what you see. So 
we cannot prevent our brains from trying to create coherence out of bits, snippets of information. Um, and that's often described as what you see is all there is. So when information is scarce, scarce, so in other words, if we have little information, our fast thinking will still try to make sense of it, which is, has a function, evolutionary. So it's, it's often described as a machine for jumping to conclusions. So if there is a first sign of danger, yeah, even if it's not totally clear yet that there is a danger in nature, that there is a lion there in the bushes, that there is some noise there, the first sign of danger is you process that information and you can jump to the conclusion there is danger. Now, final experiment, and then we're going to do the workshop. Um, question one. Was Gandhi more or less than 144 years old when he died? Now, will you, I guess you know the answer to that question. Huh? Now, the second question is, how old was Gandhi when he died? So there's two questions here. The outcome is that if you simply ask, if you ask people these two questions, and you compare it to asking only question two, the estimated age uh, to question two, when Gandhi, how old he was, it was 50% higher when asked after question one. So after when people first would, uh, were asked this question, they rated the age of Gandhi 50% higher than when they did not have this information uh, and simply were asked how old was Gandhi when he died. Now, that is a bit shocking because I think probably most of you will agree that <coughs> Obviously, Gandhi is less than uh, 144 years old. It's so obvious that you would say, well, it's a, probably most of you thought, well, that's a ridiculous question. You know, it's a totally useless question. It's uh, obvious. But the worrying thing is that asking this uh, uh, question anchors your brain towards thinking older. So something in your fast thinking, in your unconscious mind, unconsciously may gave you associations with old people, with old people's homes, with old people on beaches, with... So your brain had these associations uh, in its head. And then we asked how old was Gandhi? And because you had these things still already somewhere in your mind, uh, it was rated higher. So the anchor triggered the question and even though our slow thinking rejected immediately the question is this is incorrect uh, uh, our fast thinking process was still guided by it so the implication is and this is the, the message that i want to get across to you that we can be biased in our uh, in our judgment by our environment and uh, uh, and they can even buy even totally random factors or unrelated factors will bias our judgment so our thinking our conscious thinking process our slow rational thinking process are not as rational as we really think they are that is the implication all right so that takes to the practical uh, exercise. Uh, so we're going to do the, um, I'm going to ask all of you. So each table is a small working group. You all have this case report. Uh, you all have this list. Uh, and so what I would like you to do is uh, read the case. And whilst reading the case, uh, try to uh, fill out the, the checklist individually each of you uh, so that could be about uh, so each person does it individually for about five five to ten minutes then um, for five to ten minutes you discuss it in the group what you uh, how you rated the, the different items and if you agree or disagree on a specific topic 
And then uh, if each group could identify one person who can give uh, very short feedback uh, to the, uh, the plenary, uh, because then I'm going to ask you, okay, well, well, more or less, what were your observations? What did you notice? And then we'll have some plenary discussion uh, around uh, the case report. So, is that uh, clear for everybody? Okay, thank you. All right, something is going wrong with the projection for some reason, but... Um, uh, anyway, you have the handouts. So, again, this aspect of this thinking about bias, why is it relevant for case reports? Because case reports are stories. And case reports, stories are appealing and a powerful means of communication. It's, uh, people have been telling stories since they invented language. So it's a very old way of communicating. Um, but I try to explain that our fast thinking processes are also biased to creating coherent stories and to create a coherent stories even if we, um, uh, if there is no um, real story to tell. And um, we will make coherence, uh, the, but irrespective of the amount and the quality of the data. Uh, so these are the kind of questions what we have to ask with the slow thinking process that is the quality of the data and is the amount of information provided sufficient to enable me to draw certain conclusions that maybe at first glance seem a very coherent and convincing story. And uh, we need to be aware that our mind is partly biased because our fast thinking process will simply ignore the quality of the data and will ignore what's not there. Um, now, some of this information I have um, uh, uh, written in a recently published editorial, so uh, you can understand and read a little bit more about that. Um, and so, just, uh, I mentioned biases in association with clinical case reports. Now there can be, uh, I counted the literature, I studied the literature, and I counted uh, 29 possible types of biases. So on the one hand, I'm here making a case for cases and saying case reports are important and potentially very valuable as sources of evidence. But we also need to be aware that there can be biases in the case reports. Uh, and there are four types of biases, cognitive ones. There are decision-making biases. Uh, there are biases in probability and belief. Uh, there can be social biases and memory errors. The, m the two main categories of biases are decision-making biases, behavioral biases, and biases in probability <coughs> and belief. Now, um, what happens is that we have had a, a, a discussion, a, a working group, where we spoke about Bayes' theorem. I'm not going to do that for all of you, but it's quite no, uh, well known that um, data has two aspects. It has something that is plausible, um, but there's also something about the probability of the data. And what our brains will do what our brains are better do is that filtering information that is plausible, but we would ignore whether or not particular information is probable. And so that means that uh, we might uh, want to see an improvement in the case, um, uh, and we, it seems plausible, yeah. but maybe it's not, maybe it's probable, we're not susceptible, our mind is not susceptible to the fact that it may be probable that this case would have had that improvement irrespective. Uh, of our treatments. Um, so we, there is, sometimes our intuition can lead us to overestimate. Um, and as, as, uh, as I mentioned, the reliability and the quality of the data is, is ignored. And what we saw before uh, is this mechanism is what you see is all there is. Our brain initially will process on the basis of the information that's available, 
And only when we apply slow thinking, like the scientific thinking, that we say, well, let's look at the detail of this. Is this complete enough? Is this thorough enough? Is this potentially biased? We start thinking about the quality of the data. Um, now, very briefly, how can we remedy some of these biases? Uh, one, uh, one way of remedying these biases is to have reflective and critical thinking. It's one of the arguments I'm having is that it's good to have intuitive thinking and it's good to have fast thinking, but we also need to be aware of pitfalls, that we need to also have ref what I would call reflective thinking or critical thinking. Um, and I already mentioned that uh, sometimes our fast thinking is primed by associations, priming effects, something which is in our environment that will affect our judgment. So we need to bring in our slow thinking processes as well. And, uh, and this is something what we're all familiar with in the context of science, is that we need to have also a negative te test strategy and with a negative stress strategy, I mean that is that we're saying, well, let's not believe. Like in this particular case, that we're saying, well, the authors claim that it is due to the traditional Korean medicine. But a negative test strategy is like what you would do in an experiment, is that you say, well, your null hypothesis is that I don't believe it. Your null hypothesis. So a negative test strategy is applied to a clinical case report when you assess, okay, is this a convincing case? Is that you simply say, well, let's not believe. I, I don't believe that this is due to um, uh, uh, the traditional Korean medicine. How convincing is it? If I act from this assumption, how convincing is this case report for me? So this is where these criteria come in. This Naranjo modified Naranjo criteria is that you very explicitly ask yourself the question, well, how likely is it that there are other factors that could um, uh, cause these kinds of changes? So these criteria can help you to implement a negative test strategy. What are possible alternative explanations for the changes that we see? Did the changes occur within a plausible time frame? That is, uh, um, that will help you um, to uh, implement a negative test strategy. And for that you need an information rich environment. So if you have a fully described case which contains all these details uh, that are reflected in the care guidelines, then there are less gaps. Again, I repeat myself because it's important to get this through, is that your fast thinking process that you will want to make a story anyway if you have limited information you'll still make a story out of it so the richer the information you is you have is the better you're able to implement critical thinking on the case report so deliberately seek information that you don't have that's one way of doing it uh, and this is what we spoke about uh, with likelihood ratio when you are guided by a particular symptom for instance that would be indicative of a particular uh, pattern in uh, traditional Korean medicine <coughs> you would want to know whether you see that symptom in your, in your patient but you need to deliberately seek for the information how often would I see this uh, 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 symptom in the rest of my patients in other words you seek for the information that you don't have because by knowing how frequent this patient is in the, uh, uh, the symptom is in the patients that don't have the pattern only then you can assess well is this symptom much more frequent in the patient uh, with the pattern compared to patients that don't have the pattern so you need, you need to seek out information that you don't have um, now, obviously, how can we create an information-rich environment for case reports? Uh, use a clinical case reporting guideline. Hence, this, uh, uh, this lecture of this uh, morning. Because it imposes a more structured 
uh, and comprehensive slow thinking process. I mean, one of the comments out of the group here was said, "Whoa, uh, we would need uh, 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 it would take a if 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 I want to write up everything that should be uh, in this list, the case report would have become very big." So that's actually a challenge because how can you still write a concise case report that contains all the information? And that is very difficult. That is a very big challenge. Um, but it also indicates what you're saying. If you imply structured and slow, comprehensive thinking, you need to have a lot of information in there. And the art, of course, is still to, as a journal editor, uh, most of the time I spend uh, um, stimulating my authors to be more concise, uh, to say what they want to say, but still in a concise way. And that's, of course, a, a very big challenge in, uh, in writing your papers. So the way I do it, and most people do it, first you start with a long version, and then the second version you start uh, writing the shorter uh, version. Um, but it's, uh, it's a big challenge. So if you use a clinical case reporting guideline, you will you impose a more structured and slow th thought process. You impose some of the bias reduction strategies uh, um, I've referred to. And um, so it's really about fostering what I call positive doubt. Uh, and positive doubt is not criticism. I mean, because often doubt in the word English, people have a negative association. Doubt is an ambiguous term, but what I want to emphasize is that what we should foster is the positive side of doubt. And doubt is not saying, oh, I doubt you, uh, I, I don't trust you, I doubt you. No. Doubt is a constructive mechanism, it's a, it's, a, it's a positive mechanism whereby you question from a spirit wanting to improve, not wanting to criticize for the sake of criticizing or putting another person down you want to criticize for the sake of improving <coughs> and so yeah there's clearly positive uh, and negative uh, doubt uh, and blind faith uh, is not um, not necessarily the way that leads to a good thing I think at the moment we're seeing a lot of um, problems in our world are due to fundamentalism and people blindly uh, believing something uh, and it's been said about doubt that it's really the beginning and not the end of wisdom. Uh, and Shakespeare said modest doubt is called the beacon of the wise. Um, and I think most of you will know who said, I think, therefore I am. Uh, it is René Descartes, uh, and he's considered uh, in the 16th century, he was a French mathematician. Uh, he's considered uh, one of the founders of uh, modern rationalism. Uh, but what most people uh, for don't know is uh, that he actually said, I doubt, therefore I think. And because he, he started with doubting, and because he started doubting uh, what he was observing, only then I realized, well, the only thing I'm sure about is, what can I be sure about? This can all be illusions but I can only be sure about um, uh, that I'm thinking. Therefore, I said, I think. So therefore, I know that I'm consciously thinking, contrary to animals, that I'm thinking, so I know that I am. Uh, so it's very, very important to realize the importance of doubt uh, in general. Um, so we want to create new habits. We want to use reporting guidelines. But we also want to apply this thinking in practice. Uh, and this is a very important message for the clinicians. Uh, because it's not just when you write up your case that you can apply this thinking. It is you can apply this thinking during the consultation. Um, and I think that's, I think the beauty of this is that once you learn how to think critically and to write up cases properly, in my opinion, I think it can also help you become a better clinician uh, in daily practice in treating your patients. So we still have to live with uncertainty and that's inherent in evidence-based medicine still as well. And John Allen Paulus has said, well, uncertainty is the only certainty there is. So accept that and then learn how to live as well as you can with uncertainty. 
Um, okay. So to conclude, uh, I'm going to skip a few slides. But some of the, the vision that uh, around evidence uh, as part of evidence-based medicine is, uh, is this concept of an evidence mosaic. In other words, I've spoken initially about an evidence hierarchy being used in evidence-based medicine. Um, some, uh, I, for the past 20 years now, argue that an evidence hierarchy uh, is not always the right approach. Uh, because it's not always the right hierarchy for the right question. And uh, I argue that what we need is an evidence mosaic where, you, where there's a role for fundamental research, where there's a role for observational studies, including clinical case-based research. Of course, there's a role for clinical trials, um, uh, and there's a role for reviews. Um, but it all depends on the research question. The randomized control trial is not better than clinical case-based research. It all depends on the question you're asking. And, uh, for instance, observational studies are much better to say something about the safety of medicines than randomized control trials. But maybe randomized control trials are better than observational studies to say something about causal effects. Um, so it's all about methods, about the objective that you have, and tailoring the right method to your objective. So to conclude, we need to move from a hierarchy of evidence to a mosaic of evidence. And high quality clinical case reports are an integral part of this. Um, the care guideline and CAM specific, and CAM specific could include a traditional Korean medicine specific guideline extension. Uh, can play an important role in improving the quality of case reports. Uh, for homeopathy, we have developed a specific care uh, extension, and that would be feasible for other disciplines as well. And critical thinking in combination with the above is necessary to fully reap the benefits. Uh, and I thought maybe I conclude with Confucius, um, who said, real knowledge is to know the extent uh, of one's ignorance. Kansam Nadaf. <laughs>